Now how can something be two opposites at the same time? How can God be eternal and immortal and be temporary and mortal at the same time? How can God be self-sufficient and needy at the same time? How can something be all-knowing and ignorant of things at the same time? It doesn't mean anything. By definition, to say God became a man actually has no meaning. It's not something that can be a truth ever, because it's not something that can ever be proven. It's not something even comprehensible in terms of definition. It's like saying the square became a circle, but still was a square. Yeah? The square became a circle, but was still a square. That's what we're saying. God is defined by certain things. And man is defined by certain things. And those things are opposite. You can't be the same, you can't be the two things at the same time. In fact, that will be, should be enough for anybody to realize the absurdity of the claim that Jesus is God. Jesus is perfect God and perfect man. It doesn't mean anything. You can't be perfectly knowing everything and perfectly not knowing everything at the same time. And for someone who often says, well, God can do anything, of course there are many replies to that. One of them is to ask, answer it with another question. Well, can God do something evil? If he's a good God, and he is a God who is all good, can he do evil? If God is all-knowing can he, and, and God is wise, can he do something stupid? No, God has certain attributes. God has a certain nature that defines God. So by definition, that's what defines God. If God is immortal, he does not die. If God is self-sufficient, he does not eat and breathe. And we have too many descriptions in the Gospel of Jesus, of his mortality. Of course, according to Christian theology, he dies on the cross. He's killed. Can you kill God? According to the Bible, Jesus doesn't know things. He's ignorant of things. He is weak. He forgets. He's human. He eats. He walks in the marketplace. He breathes air. This is Jesus. There's one amazing example that is so clear. It's the famous example of the fig tree that one day Jesus is riding on a donkey. Think about it. Does God ride on a donkey? And he sees a fig tree and he feels hungry. So God is hungry. And he wants to eat some figs. So he goes to the fig tree and he finds there's no figs on the tree. That means from the donkey to the fig tree, he couldn't see whether there were figs or not. Is that someone who sees everything? He didn't even know there were no figs on the tree. And it becomes more surprising because when there were no figs on the tree, it says, because it wasn't the season for figs. So he didn't even know when the seasons were. And he's supposed to be the creator of the seasons. So, we've got a God riding on a donkey who gets hungry, okay, who doesn't know whether there's figs on the tree and doesn't even know the seasons of the figs, right? And when he sees there's no figs on the tree, he gets so upset, he curses the fig tree and it withers and dies. Now, that is truly extraordinary. Because most Christians would say in defense is that, no, all of that was the human side of Jesus. The human side of Jesus was his riding on a donkey, his not knowing, his feeling hungry. But the God bit of Jesus was when he cursed the fig tree and it withered and died. Now, the extraordinary thing is that you have the, the, the divine side of Jesus, therefore, acting upon the human side and depending upon it. What does this mean? How can this ever be a truth? And then we have the other claim, that Jesus is the Son of God. Now this is a question we really have to ask. What does a person mean by that? Words have meanings. What does it mean? Son of God. 
Now I know what it means about my son. I know what my son is. My son is the product of an intimate act that took place between me and my wife. And a son was born. Okay, that's my son. Yes, we all understand what that means. So do we mean that God literally begat? The word begat meaning sired. If God literally begat a son, that means God must have had intercourse. God must have begat a son means God must have had intimate relations with a woman. Of course, this is the very question the Quran asks. If Allah, God, had a son, then who is Allah's wife? If Allah had a son, who is his wife? Because God must have had intimate relations to have a son, literally. So most people would agree, no, we don't believe that. That's not what we say. We don't believe that Jesus is literally the son of God. Okay, so what do you claim then? That God, that God adopted Jesus as a son? Now again, we want to know, does that have any real meaning? So for example, if I brought along today uh, a little poodle, okay, and I, hear, and I say, here's John, my son. Okay, now I know the Arabs in the audience are going to find this particularly funny, but for us English, you know, there are some English people who, believe me, they love their dogs more than they love their kids. Okay, but even so, if someone said, this dog is my son, even if they were English, you'd still say, no, wait a minute, that's a dog and you're a human being. And if, what if he goes on to say, no, he's my son, he eats with me at the table, the adoption papers are coming through next week, okay, this is my son. And you would say, look, you're a human being, that is a dog, you can't take a dog as your son, you have to take a human being as your son. Something like you. Yes? That's what we understand. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's an absurdity. In fact, you know how we, in, uh, how we insult people? We say, Ibn Qalb, you son of a dog. Huh? You say that someone is the son of a dog. Even in America they have it, you son of a dog. Okay? They have that. Okay, and the reason they have that is because you equate a human being with being like something that is less than a human being. So believe me, believe me, when the Prophet wasallam, the Messenger of God, who Allah sent to clarify the truth of all of these things, Muhammad, he said that Allah said, the son of Adam has insulted me. This is what Allah said. The son of Adam has insulted me and he had no right to do so. What right do we have to insult God? And as for our insulting God, that is our saying that God has a son. That is our saying that God, because we are not anything like God. We are small little specks. I flew in an aeroplane for 24 hours over the surface of this earth. I looked down from all the way up there and humanity became what? Little specks. On an earth that is a little speck in a solar system that is a speck on the outer spiral of our galaxy, the Milky Way, which is 10,000 light years across. Our galaxy is one of thousands of galaxies, millions of galaxies in the known universe. Even our galaxy is a speck. And we're going to say that God, God, the creator of the universe, this universe, which is it's like a ring thrown in the desert compared to the kursi. This is what the Prophet said. This universe is like a ring thrown in the desert compared to the kursi. And the kursi is like a ring thrown in the desert compared to the arsh, meaning the throne of God. The universe is an infinitesimally small speck compared to the throne of God. And we're going to say, God, God was a speck in a speck in a speck. God's son was a speck? That is insulting God. There is no doubt. God is totally free from such a thing. He doesn't need a son. He is in no need of a son. And he is in no need to kill an innocent human being in order to forgive people's sins. All you have to do is to recognize that you have done something that is offensive to God and from the bottom of your heart, seek and pray and beg for his forgiveness.